This is Lecture 70 in the FOA series of lectures on fiber optics. In this lecture, we're going to talk about rural broadband, obstacles and opportunities. I'm Jim Hayes, President and Co-Founder of the Fiber Optic Association and someone who's been involved in fiber optics for about 40 years. And in those 40 years, I've been involved with many fiber optic projects. With the help of the many technical advisors who work with the FOA, we've worked on a lot of fiber broadband projects. Starting, of course, with Verizon, where we helped Fios get started in the early 2000s. But we've also worked with dozens of rural networks and that's what we're going to talk about in this lecture. I have some personal experience with rural networks because when we first moved to California, we lived on a farm in rural northern San Diego County. The previous owner did not have internet access, did not have broadband, did not have cable TV. So we had to do some homework before we moved, and we found that our neighbor up the road did indeed have cable television. He did have internet with a cable modem, and that we could get service. So when we bought the farm and moved in, the first thing we had to do was to arrange to have a cable TV network hook up with a cable modem service. That's when we learned how difficult getting broadband in a rural area can be. Before the cable TV company would install our network, we had to go to their offices and deliver them a pretty good sized check to pay for the project. When they showed up, they had to do underground cable construction, including, as you can see with the guys on the left, quite a bit of directional boring under our neighbor's driveways. Eventually, we got a very well, slow internet connection compared to what we had back in Boston, but it worked, and that kept us going for a while. When we decided to get a backup system going, we had to go satellite. It was just as a new company, Viasat, started offering internet satellite service in competition with Hughes, so we became a Viasat customer. Eventually, AT&T, our landline service provider, began offering DSL, so for a while we had all three services. Eventually, we also had internet connection over smartphones. So we had four services going. Just before we sold the farm and moved into the city, we were negotiating with actually a fifth service, which was a line of sight Wi-Fi available in the neighborhood. The reason we had all these services was simple. One, we needed backup. And two, we liked to test them to see how good they were. So we learned a lot about rural broadband during our period of owning a farm. When we say rural, what we mean is not urban, not in a city. It's areas that have low geographic density, where long distances separate a small number of people. You have small towns, farms. You often have mountains and plains. In the United States, small towns usually have electricity, phone service, and occasionally even cable TV systems. But generally, television is handled by satellite service. Often, the service providers are not the large guys that handle urban areas, but are small systems or co-ops. And often, those don't have the capital or the commitment to convert to fiber to the home or expand 
to more rural areas. To understand the difference between rural and urban, all you have to do is look at satellite pictures. On the left is a neighborhood in Los Angeles not far from where the FOA headquarters are. On the right is Anza, a town in the mountains north of the Mojave Desert where we helped set up a fiber to the home system. You can see just from the pictures the difference in population density and that makes a major difference in building networks. The cost is so much higher when the population density is so much lower. The problem with rural broadband is simple. It's economics. I remember when I took economics in college, economics was defined as the study of the allocation of scarce resources. Rural areas are too small to get the attention of major service providers. The geographic expanse means it's expensive to connect subscribers and it get, leads to a poor return on investment, which is always a problem if you're a public company looking to Wall Street to keep them happy. In an earnings report in 2021, AT&T CEO John Stanky said he basically doesn't think there's any way to extend fiber to many rural areas at all. There's nothing new about this problem. Nothing at all. Exactly the same situation existed in America a hundred years ago with rural electrification. We've been studying rural electrification as a model for rural broadband. And the similarities are startling. Here's a quote from an article titled Rural Electrification by an economist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1940. After a careful study of the rural electrification problem, the Mississippi Valley Committee reported in October 1934 that several reasons might be advanced to explain why only 10% of the nation's farms purchase electricity. These are the lack of interest by operating companies in rural electrification, the high cost of line construction because of the unnecessarily expensive type of line used, onerous restrictions covering rural line extensions, and high rates. If you take that quote and replace electrification with broadband, it makes perfect sense today. The solutions offered by Professor Biel almost a century ago were very simple. He noted that rural electrification grew from 10% in 1935 to 25% in 1940, a massive growth in only five years. What caused that? The government, the U.S. government, established funds to create loans and grants to assist in rural electrification. They set up what's called as the Rural Electrification Administration. The major service providers working in the cities did not do the work. It was done by electrical cooperatives, nonprofits starting by those in rural areas wanting service. And many of those are still in operation today. The final part of the service extension was to simplify design and construction of the networks, which reduces the cost. Again, what rural electrification solutions were proposed a century ago work very well for rural broadband today. The differences between urban and rural construction are quite obvious. The crew on the left is installing cables in downtown Santa Monica, California, 
using directional boring. The crew on the right are working for the Anza Electrical Cooperative, installing aerial cables in the northern edge of the Mojave Desert. It's pretty obvious how much difference there is in the complexity of the project and the simplicity of rural aerial construction, for example. What we've talked about so far is in the United States, but no matter where you are in the world, the situation is quite similar. To get communications and internet to rural Turkey, they use an aerial solution with small poles that only carried the fiber optic cables. Here is, for example, the transition point between several cables outside the historic site of Troy. Remember the Trojan horse and the Trojan War? On the right is a different solution. In British Columbia, the weather is so bad that aerial cables are likely to be harmed by winter weather, so they have to go underground. But this contractor discovered that by using micro-trenching as opposed to regular trenching, he could cut the cost of the cable installation tremendously, and in part because he could do so much more distance per day. So there's a solution that people think of as an urban solution being used in an area that is really, really rural. Fiber is always the best solution for connecting customers for broadband, but there are alternatives, and sometimes economics will dictate that. Aerial cables are always the least expensive, and they're more acceptable in rural areas than urban areas now. There's also the possibility of installing fiber optic cables on electrical transmission lines. We'll talk about that in a minute. The other option for rural networks is always line-of-sight Wi-Fi, where cable is too expensive. But you still need a fiber backbone, and very often the bandwidth is going to be limited. One of the options in rural networks is, of course, to find partners, and particularly local co-ops, both electrical co-ops and telephone co-ops. We started looking at electrification after we did a project with the Electric Power Research Institute on using fiber and learned how easy it is to install optical fiber along the lines currently used for electrical cables. So if you have a local electrical co-op, they're the first people to start talking to. Electrical utilities need fiber optics for communications and for grid management. So very often they are ideal partners for rural broadband. The other partners you need, of course, are the local population. You need to get the people involved and make sure that they're behind the project. It's also important to involve local real estate developers, homeowners associations, and businesses because the availability of broadband helps them, especially in a society now that has more and more people working from home, especially in rural areas. This isn't intended to be a technical discussion, but there are a couple of things we'd like to mention. One of the things is there's some new technology that can be very helpful. The fiber to the home passive optical networks that work in urban areas often don't work in rural areas. But the manufacturers of the communications equipment that help you build ponds, passive optical networks, have been working on solutions. One promising solution is what's called a passive optical network with a mini OLTS. OLTS is optical line terminal. 
The mini alts allow local head ends to be built much more economically than using the same kind of large equipment designed for urban areas with tens of thousands of subscribers. These systems are actually viable sometimes with as few as 100 subscribers. And they can be easily strung along the cables hung from poles, just like uh, the old cable TV amplifiers you're used to in suburban areas. This can be a particularly attractive solution for electrical utilities because it can run several different networks simultaneously. So they can have their grid management on a network separate from the broadband provided to local customers. Most suppliers of electronics for passive optical networks now have a solution like this. Some of the ideas proposed for saving money on rural broadband don't really seem to make sense. For example, one planner on a rural network told me they were considering putting in cables with only six fibers, expecting that the cost of installation and the cost of the cable would save them money. But in fact, cables with fewer than 24 fibers are not cheaper because the cost of making the cable isn't in the fiber, it's in the manufacturing. There's hardly any money savings in installation either. The basic cost of installing a cable is the same no matter how many fibers are in it, except for the cost of the splicing of the individual fibers, which is relatively small compared to the construction costs. You're better off installing enough fibers or a lot of extra fibers because at some point you're probably going to need them. And fiber is so cheap, it's amazing. A friend of mine likes to describe the cost of fiber as cheaper than kite string and monofilament fishing line. <laughs> One of the problems, of course, is that whatever solution you choose for rural broadband, it's going to take time. Literally, it will take years before you find a solution. At the current time in rural areas, your best bet is satellite service. Internet by satellite providers like Hughes and Viasat can provide you with reliable internet service at a reasonable cost. But what you don't have is the available bandwidth to stream video. That means you're also going to need a second satellite service for television. You might be able to get rural Wi-Fi while you're waiting for your fiber, but that requires at least a fiber backbone in the region and line of sight availability. Many rural areas already have Wi-Fi providers, so check your area and see if one is available. If you're building a brand new network, you're probably going to start with some kind of backbone and build out the middle mile before you build fiber to the home. While your customers are waiting for fiber to the home, a line of sight wireless system may be a quick way to get them connected while they're waiting for their fiber. Here are some things to remember. And the most important one is every project is different. Every project is unique. You must come up with a solution that fits your particular situation, and it may be different from what others have found works for them. No solution fits every project. You have to be patient. Broadband fiber projects don't get done in weeks or months. They take years. So you need patience, and that means you also need commitment particularly if local politicians and governments are involved. Broadband projects, rural or urban, take time. They take time to analyze and plan the network. They take time to get funding. They take time to get components and do the installation and turn it up 
and then they take time to connect subscribers. So one of the things you really have to have to build a network like this is patience, and you have to have commitment for a long-term project. The people involved in the project need contacts and they need experience because you'll not only have to do technical design, you'll have to get permits, you'll have to get permissions. There's a whole number of other people that you have to deal with. So choose your partners carefully and make sure they understand that this is a project that's going to take time and patience. If you decide to hire a consultant to help you with the design, look into their references and credentials carefully. We've seen several instances where groups hired consultants and it didn't turn out well. In one case, a rural HOA hired a consultant, paid them a front-end deposit, waited a year, and the consultant came back to tell them they couldn't help them. So they had not only lost their deposit, but they had lost a whole year in the project. In two other instances we're aware of, consultants who were probably more oriented toward urban environments did designs for rural networks and small towns, and the cost came out to about $10,000 per connection, about three to five times what it should have been. In both cases, we were able to look at the reports, and they were for designs that were inappropriate for the rural type environment. So as we said very early on, and just like with rural electrification, that if you're going to do a rural project, you need to think rural. If you're thinking about a rural fiber to the home network, or a small town network, or of course even an urban network, you should be interested in the FOA's FTTH handbook. We created this handbook as an overview of how to build fiber to the home with lots of technical information as well as information on how to start, design, and execute a project. One of the chapters in the FTTH handbook is about do-it-yourself projects and shows how two rural projects were done successfully by the locals. It's worth reading. There are solutions to rural broadband networks and of course now there appears to be a commitment among state and local governments as well as the federal government to help provide the funding that's needed, very similar to the way the Rural Electrification Administration did in the 1930s to connect rural areas with electricity. The FOA doesn't have all the answers, but we do have a lot of information, and we've created a web page at foa.org rural with resources that you can use to help plan your project. And of course, you can always contact us at any time, and we're happy to share what we know and who we know to help you get your project going. We're the Fiber Optic Association, the International Professional Association of Fiber Optics, and the worldwide recognized certification body for fiber optic technicians. The FOA website, foa.org, is our main website and it includes the FOA guide with almost a thousand pages of free technical information that you can use to help with your projects. We also have fiberu.org with more than two dozen free online self-study programs you can use for your own training and to help train your people and your workers involved in your project. 